Okay, welcome back to our last session of the TIFF Summit. And today we have our guests from throughout the week to participate in a panel discussion. So again, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate your time and we're gonna have some fun today. So I'm Melanie Kitchen and I'm with Erie One Bosis, technology integrator uh, for the Winnie Rec. And here with me is... I'm Guile Kitchen. I am married to Melanie Kitchen, and I am the, <laughs> one of the IT for Learning consultants for the District School Board of Niagara. Uh, this was actually all the brainchild of Andy Wheelock, who is also with us, but off camera at the moment. Um, interestingly enough, he came to me with the idea because we run our TIFF sessions in Western New York. There he is. Um, and it kind of just worked out. I'm American. He's Canadian, we work in um, our own countries, um, but doing the same thing. So we thought this would be a really interesting conversation um, just to talk about what we do. So I will have all our panelists introduce themselves and we'll start with Amy, Amy Bloom. Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Bloom. I have a position very much like Melanie and Andy. I am a staff development specialist for Erie 2, so I work with a variety of schools for curriculum and technology integration. Thanks, Amy. Dan, you're up next. Thank you again for having me today. I'm Dan Armstrong. I teach in St. Catharines, Ontario with the District School Board of Niagara. Work with Kyle. And I'm a kindergarten grade eight teacher uh, in the learning commons, which we have no idea what's gonna look like in September. We should be <laughs> Thank you. Derek. Hey everyone, thanks for joining as well. Um, my name is Derek Tangredi. I live and teach in London, Ontario for the University of Western Ontario, as well as Thames Valley District School Board. Thanks, Derek. And Aaron. Hi, I'm Erin Quinn. I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I teach grade eight humanities, which is language arts and social studies and have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Erin. Mary? Hi, I am Mary Howard. I'm a sixth grade teacher on Grand Island, New York, very close to our Canadian neighbors, and um, I teach science and ELA. And hopefully, after we're finished, I'll be hopping in a kayak and maybe even drifting over the border in the Niagara River and back. So, um, <laughs> we're close to our neighbors here. We'll let them know you're coming. <laughs> Mike. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Mike Dresick. I am the District Technology Integrator at Lakeshore Central Schools in Angola, New York. I'm happy to be joining this awesome panel today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, Mike. Nina. Nina Clarko, I work at Lewiston Porter um, in the US. Um, again, just a little north of Niagara Falls. I teach eighth grade mathematics, a course called Innovation Experience. And I have weaseled my way into TIFF as an honorary technology integrator using all of these skills in both of those places. I'm super happy to be here. It's been an awesome week. Um, the presenters have done a fantastic job. And anybody I missed live, I'm going to go back and rewatch these recordings. Great job. Awesome. Thanks, Nina. Rob. Hey, everybody. My name is Rob Dunlop. I'm the one of the other IT consultant uh, for District School Board of Niagara. I work side by side with Kyle all the time, and we just try and contain Dan the best we can within our school board. So, yeah, it's amazing. We get to do technology. So, yeah, I also have really enjoyed this week, and uh, I think it's a super crew you put together, guys. So, I'm just uh, honored to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And Tara. Hi, I teach also in Calgary, Alberta, Canada with Erin Quinn. Um, she and I uh, co-teach and work together. I also teach grade eight humanities. Great, thanks for being here, Tara. All right, do you wanna have the honors of the first question? Sure. So we wrote questions separately and we came together and now I only have one question because my wife has asked the exact same question. So this is why we live together. Um, so let's start, let's start really, really hard right out of the gun because that's how we like to do things uh, here. Um, so with everything that's happened over the last three months, what are some of your takeaways that you think are going to be necessary, 
uh, useful, imperative for when we go back to teaching, not knowing what that looks like <laughs> next year. So to start with, uh, we'll just do the hand raise to start with, because I know some of you need more think time than others. Amy, go ahead. I think um, the biggest thing too takeaways from what I gathered from working with a variety of different schools is number one, we need to instill independence in our children and our students, giving them more um, advocacy for their own learning uh, because I felt like that was last, lost in translation when we weren't in front of uh, their teachers. So I think that's that skill is very important. The second thing that has been very relevant this last couple of weeks is alternative assessments. Not everything has to be a quiz and a test because the biggest thing that kept coming up is like, how are we going to assess these kids? If I give them a test, they're going to Google the answers. And I can't tell you that I wouldn't Google the answers either. So what are alternative ways that we're getting them to critically think about how they can demonstrate their mastery of knowledge? Awesome, thanks, Amy. Nina and then Rob. Um, when we get back in the fall, whatever that looks like, um, I think the biggest takeaway we're going to need is uh, some trauma informed care here where we really connect with kids and figure out and help them process everything that's kind of just going by the wayside in the summer. And we don't know and how fearful they're going to be when they get back. So a lot of this uh, empathy driven instruction where we're really student centered and and like Amy said, it's going to look alternative. It's not going to be this one size fits all for everybody. So I'm super excited. The stuff that we've been doing for a while now is probably going to be a little bit more mainstream just out of uh, sheer necessity. <laughs> Thanks. Rob? Yeah, and I totally agree with uh, Nina there. You know, one thing I, that you, you were really able to see when all of a sudden we weren't able to go to our schools and be with our kids is how much they actually miss their teachers and how much they need that connection. and. You know, Kyle and I, we've really been looking at a lot in terms of engagement and, and, and the number of people that are coming in and working with those teachers. And those kids don't want to come if they don't see face to face or hear that teacher's voice or, you know, so it's one of those things like whether it be synchronous, whether it be videos, whether it be audio feedback, but how do we build that in? The other thing that, you know, I really think we need to look at with regards to technology is the idea of often I think we look at what we do and how does technology help us do what we do and what we normally do. And I think we have to shift that. We have to look at what is it, what can the technology do and how can we change what we're doing? What, how, can we, how can we look at that technology and say, what can it do and how can I change my practice to really make that engaging and meaningful and, and do all the things we want? I, I think moving forward, we gotta realize that it, we just can't do the same thing every year. We have to change our practice greatly if we really want to truly adapt to these changing conditions. Mike, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you know, during this time, I had the uh, experience of kind of doing this at, through, as a, through the parent lens. I'm with a first grader at home and also um, observing my wife who teaches uh, third grade special education as well as supporting teachers. So I'm hoping when we come out of this that um, teachers will remember some of the risks that they took during this time. Like when we get back to maybe falling into our routines, um, and maybe, you know, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I heard it from a lot of teachers and I would have never tried this before or, or I didn't know how to do, you know, whatever it is. Um, they took those risks and they kind of became learners uh, more than ever before maybe. Um, and and I, I feel like that may be one of the silver linings that comes out of this. Uh, so I just wanted them to kind of remember that. And I heard it from my own son's teacher. I've heard it from people that I supported. Uh, but it's really just in, in um, I guess, getting comfortable taking that risk. And this situation just pushed so many people out of their comfort zone. So um, I feel like there's some uh, advantages uh, to that. And then we could leverage those um, in, in, in moving forward. I think it's interesting because one of the fears that I have about going back is losing the this momentum that we have started, you know, that um, people may go back to doing what they were doing before when they've just got, gotten started possibly. Um, so when everyone's talking about safety and health, and I agree with all of that, but I'm, I'm fearful of, you know, we have an opportunity here and I hope that momentum continues. Tara. Um, I think when I'm I'm listening to everything that's being said, and I, I just agree wholeheartedly, 
Um, you know, Amy was talking about that that assessment piece and alternative forms of assessment, and and then I look at the the privilege that has come into play and has really been brought into stark relief. Um, you know, across our system, um, where where we're supposed to have the the equalizing factor of public education and and how that isn't the case and how it's been brought so it, it's been made so apparent through this process and i really i look at the kids who've struggled in this process and what what do they need um you know and nina's talking about that social emotional supports that we're going to need to have for those kids but i also look at the kids who've thrived in this process and what is it about what we've done differently that's enabled those kids to be so successful? Because sometimes they're, they're kids who weren't as successful in the classroom setting, mm -hmm. and they've really been able to step up and really show what they know in this setting. How are we going to bring that back? How are we going to hold on to those gains? Like, like Michael was talking about, how are we going to hold on to that progress? Aaron and then Mary. I hope I'm through okay. The last little bit was kind of glitchy for me, so hopefully I'm all right. Um, I would like to add to what Tara said and um, focus a little bit on one of the silver linings that I've seen through this um, in teaching grade eight. Um, when I'm talking to my students about those things that they love about this experience, um, something that keeps coming up again and again is the autonomy that the students had and how it was um, them who were making decisions about what they wanted to work on and when they wanted to work on it. And um, for me, that's kind of my biggest challenge, I think, if we go back to a face-to-face -face setting, is how can I build that, that choice and voice into my students' learning experience so that they can maintain that autonomy? Awesome. Um, again, going back to what Tara was talking about, uh, one of the, one of the deciding factors is the same deciding factor when it came to student success in the classroom, and that was the parent involvement. For me, those students that were successful in this model were because they had parents at home that were pushing them and guiding them and, you know, moving them forward. Those are exactly the same students that are successful in the classroom. You've got that parental involvement. But when, you know, we brought all the learning home and we, the parents, it was right there. You know, it was if they chose to, to see it. And on the flip side, I didn't necessarily have all of my sixth graders autonomous and the ones that were and the ones that were really, really independent in the classroom. Suddenly, kind of the reverse happened with the distance learning. The parents kind of set them aside and they're like, oh, they're fine, they're gonna be fine. And then I had missed assignment after missed assignment after confused directions and, you know, so it was the flip was crazy to see for me um, when it comes to those two factors. Go ahead, Nina. Mike mentioned that, again, teachers were risk takers and able to take that leap out of um, sheer, again, necessity, but Aaron brings a really good point to the mix. I think our kids were a little bit um, more willing to take a risk for twofold. Number one, they had a little bit of say in their in their process and how they were doing it and when they were doing it. And I think there was less risk for them. On our, our side, we, um, the, the grades weren't the focus anymore. So they would take a risk now because they they aren't going to be held to the same accountability that they were, were in the classroom. So when we're talking about assessment, we're talking about how we're going to continue to motivate kids to do this. It really doesn't have to be learner driven instead of grade driven. So I think I had some of my least, my most risk averse kids take a risk because they're like, ah, I'm not going to hurt me now. I might as well give it a go. It's on my terms <laughs> and I'm not going to be punished if I so-called fail. So um, I think that risk taking was in place for them as well. Can we talk as mod? I don't like being a moderator because I want to see my face in the little box over there. Like, am I allowed to talk? Can I? Yes, you're allowed to talk, <laughs> Kyle. So, <laughs> hi everybody. Um, so like, and like, this is how I roll too by listening to conversation and forming things and, and analyzing like what you know, like everyone just said and, and Mary ignored this because you know who I'm gonna talk about with my kids. <laughs> we had one who's very successful in school and we had to be on top of her all the time. Um, our son who, for those you know, who has um, high functioning autism, 
he struggled the first two weeks, but then you could see certain teachers kind of change their planning about here's my curriculum versus here's student centered curriculum that I need to lay out for them for every day so they know what's happening. It's not going to be posted 2 p.m. via email or on Tuesday, it's through Google Classroom. So he got a schedule and you could see which classes he started to excel in because he knew it was coming. It was laid out for him and he could take that autonomy and he did really successful uh, being home. And this is including his breaks for, you know, Minecraft and all his other stuff, but he had that schedule, but because those teachers laid it out and you could see them progress, which I was really proud of. A lot of teachers really said, you know what, this isn't working. I can feel my students aren't handing things in and they adapted, they changed on the fly, which is super hard to do when you know you don't have everything you have. So that's one thing I hope to see also next year come in like, you know, for me, it's always planning with the learner in mind, which I know we always say we want to do as teachers, but sometimes you forget when we're curriculum driven and we have agendas and <clears throat> state testing and things like that, that we have to teach to and make sure they learn everything. So I think another piece of that is um, we also helped him build structure in a schedule. And once we were able to, that, like he will follow at 10 o'clock <laughs> is my break oh, yeah. and I need to take my break <laughs> at 10 o'clock. Whereas we tried to put the schedule together for our daughter and, and um, they're 14 and 15 and a half. So very close in age. Um, she wants no part of it. Like that would stress her out. She wants no part of a schedule. She will just, you know, do what she needs to do when she needs to do it. Although she didn't always do what she needed to do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that that wasn't working for her. So we had to personalize how we handled them. For each of their personalities, it was, you know, very, very different. Um, and there was something else. I was, oh, you were talking about uh, the teachers um, figuring out that they needed to change, you know, that what they had been doing at the start, they needed to kind of um, pivot and change how they were going to go through the rest of the year. So I kind of, I have a follow up question, but I think Dan wanted to say something first. Go ahead, Dan. Just to kind of piggyback on what everyone else was saying um, about, uh, I think, having the interaction, having the face-to-face -face, um, Google Meets was, was a huge, huge um, change with some students, just to have the easement talking to their, their teacher, talking to their fellow classmates. Um, the supports for the teachers, I'm already getting uh, emails and requests about all this free stuff that came about COVID. Well, come September, it's going to be costing us, and they're already saying, look at, we need this, and we're going back online. Look at, I need this for my classroom, because I had such a great response from them. Um, one thing we, we should be looking at is um, staff working with staff and creating those um, interchangeable um, lesson plans that you can include the language and the math and the science and the social studies, so you can get more than one teacher involved in having those big, big activities that they can all kind of work towards. Mm-hmm. Mary. I just wanted to add one other thing that Kyle just kind of can we just talk about student biorhythms? You know, why are we going oh, to school at 7 30 in the morning? Because none of my kids showed up for anything until noon. It, it, I was just about to say that, Mary. I'm sorry. <laughs> my kids thrive. They slept till nine o'clock. They got up. They love the ability to do go to school when they wanted to, unless they had a specific Google Meet at this particular time. They thrived on that. Now, my oldest is um, very high on the spectrum too, so he needed that schedule. So his school, he went to a private school, came home with that schedule and he was fine. My younger two, as long as they had a checklist and they completed that checklist, it was like a game every day. This is what you had to do, this is your expectations, and they don't even want to go back. So I'm thinking come September, <laughs> I'm gonna have to do a lot of convincing if we're face to face that you need to go. Mm. Tara. Yeah, I also have three people in my house, one of whom has autism. And um, my son is is a great example. I He thrived in this situation and, and his classroom teachers said, you know, within two weeks of going online that they had had more conversations with him, learned more about him, knew more about him as a learner than they had in a year of having him in the classroom. Because for him, the key was that the social anxiety of all of the noise and all of the things going on in the classroom and in the school were gone. 
And so he could sit down and work through and the tech tools with the teachers learning and adapting, um, you know, the ability to, to give him that, those tasks and have him use that tech to support that and them understanding what resources worked with the tech and what resources didn't. So that feedback loop with parent and school that, that was able to tighten up in this process that, that we didn't even, you know, I say tighten up, but that we didn't even really have beforehand um, was really something that, that I think, you know, for me as a teacher, I want to take back into the classroom is, is how to bring that, that feedback loop from home, um, what's working what's working back into into my practice and then I I think the other piece of that too is you know the ability my son is 14 and so he gets a lot of times doesn't want to do an adapted task it's not what everybody else is doing I want to do what everybody else is doing even though that's not the right task for him and in this setting he got his task that met him where he was at and he didn't see what everybody else was getting yeah. And he did his work where he was at and moved to the next step. And so the growth was phenomenal for him because his teachers were able to do that. Um, so that's another one for me where I'm like, how do we bring that back into the classroom? Yeah, yeah. I mean, with ours, like, transition time, going from class to class and the anxiety of getting there on time, making sure you have the right mm -hmm. books and the tools that you need, mm -hmm. like that was taken away from our son and it worked like, Everything he needs is right there. He might mm -hmm. be on a chair, a couch, still in my basement, but he travels with the essentials that he needs to achieve success. <laughs> Derek? Uh, just one of the things as I'm sitting here processing, but I think you're all touching on it um, so eloquently, but I think you're all hitting on the same point that one advantage we have that I don't know if some people have considered is that we began the year in the classroom and that teachers already established that great SEL and personal relationships with each and every one of these kids. And they could transfer agency more easily to the learner because they knew more about the learner and what they already had from a classroom perspective. So I guess I'm more posing a question to everybody in that what happens if we don't go back in September and you get new kids and you don't have the same funds of knowledge to build on? Will it be, will their online learning experience be the same or will it be dramatically different for those kids? Like I know from my kids, what, like I'm seeing what you guys were talking about, like some of my kids are thriving and they're doing incredible stuff. But I also knew what some of their strengths were, what some of their weaknesses were, and I had that classroom landscape to pull from. But what happens if we don't? I just kind of want to, like, I know I'm not the moderator, but I guess I'm throwing up. This is why you're not invited, Tan, into the kitchen household. No. Scratch this one. I love it, because if, if you're going to ask the question, then I'm going to answer, because I'm not asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, and so when I'm, I, I'm a technology integrator, I provide professional development, so um, I'm thinking, what can I do to support teachers in August before school starts? Um, you know, what are they going to need day one? What's going to happen if we are full time virtual day one? We start with community building, we start with building those relationships um, between us and the kids and the kids with each other. So what does that look like in a virtual environment? And um, here we are concentrating quite a bit on the CASEL standards, the social emotional learning standards that we have. Um, New York State has benchmarks that are based on CASEL. Um, and it's all about, uh, you know, being able to be independent, how to interact with people, how to be responsible for yourself, um, recognizing emotions in other people. So there's a lot of all of those great kind of skills in there. Also, there is the habits of mind, um, which address skills like perseverance, problem solving, critical thinking, you know, um, and there's a, a great way to crosswalk those because they are very similar that you can work on those together. Now, from a technology point of view, I'm thinking these skills need to be explicitly taught. This is not just something that we say, oh, they're just going to pick that up or we're just going to work in a group. It's just going to be fine. Even more so if it's virtual, that we need to be explicit in that instruction. So going back to what Nina was saying about, you know, trauma-informed teaching and being really sensitive to the kids, 
when we are wanting them to gain these skills, we also need to be at the same time teaching them the technology. So we can't assume that they know how to use the technology, even with what we've been through this year. Maybe last year they were using um, Seesaw and this year they're using Google Classroom, completely different platform. Um, digital citizenship, um, all of those kinds of skills, we can't assume that they already have those. If you look at the digital citizenship um, ISTE standards, those blend in very nicely, really all of the standards blend in very nicely with the SEL and the habits of mind. So what I'm doing is working on a crosswalk between all three of those and how do I start of the year, build a relationship and teach them the technology that they need. So maybe that means I'm gonna post an assignment and I'll teach you how to do the assignment, but the assignment is about a skill that I want you to have within the realm of um, habits of mind or social emotion. We call that the dual objective of I'm going to teach one thing through the other. And it's as if this pandemic um, pulled the empathy out of people like, oh, all of a sudden kids are having trouble and it doesn't have to be my way. Like they can do it their way. So again, like Melanie said, I hope that momentum carries through because I do really think there are some people that are like Kyle said, so driven by this curriculum and blinded by all of that, that we don't see that that's a person in front of us and every day they have troubles and they're showing up to your classroom late and they don't want to be late. They don't want that to, to happen. But now it took this to say, wow, I guess I do have to be sensitive to my kids needs before they'll do anything for me. So Derek, I think you're right. Um, I think being a good people will recognize that virtually as well, but for people who didn't initially, that's going to be a struggle to really build those bonds through through a computer screen. Uh, we'll go Rob and then Aaron. Yeah, I think the other thing we just got to consider is not like an answer or anything, but the, like what was their previous year's experience like? Like some people are going to go in with a very positive experience of remote learning and being like, I had a blast doing this and I'm excited for it. And they they, they felt connected to it, but there's other people who are going to go in with a, a really bad taste in their mouths or their parents are going to be like, well, we don't like this. And it's going to be very interesting. Like, how do you reconnect those people that didn't have good experiences or wasn't, um, it wasn't addressed? I think that's something we really need to think about. We really need to go back and check out some of the analytics and try and find out via feedback or via conversations like, what was the disconnect? What, what what happened? Why weren't these students? Because we can't just say like, well, it's not on us. It's not on us that they didn't log in. That's not our problem. It is our problem. We got to figure out what it is we did. What didn't we do right? How didn't we connect? How do we lose them? And how do we come back? And I think right off the beginning, as I think, you know, we, we got to look at it positively too, is that we are at an advantage in some ways starting is that all these teachers levels of technology have increased, but students comfort with being online and building schedules and as as you know we've been as each our families have been working around how do we make this work within our households at least if we don't start in a classroom together we're starting with something that's almost like our new normal but i think we really have to really have to think about the ones we did not get and the ones that weren't coming in what are we going to do to um make sure that does not happen um, here, I think it's really important. Aaron, I'm um, thinking about your question, Derek. I think that um, technology is actually one way that that this that could help us here. And as we're talking about teachers learning things on the go, one of the things that I learned through this experience was the power of a one-on-one -on -one Google Meet with a kid um, versus a whole class kind of meet. Um, <laughs> We, Tara and I, are doing exit interviews with our students um, this week and next week. And um, it's been so wonderful to talk to them about um, their growth and like what they've learned this year and what stands out about grade eight for them. Um, so much so that we're, we need to figure out a way to do that if we're back in the classroom because it's so powerful. Um, so I think that like the relationship with the student and I, if, if we're in a situation where um, we have a new group of kids in September, uh, that's not my that's not my concern. I, I know I can build that relationship with these kids. What my um, kind of what's bigger for me is the connection between the students themselves and the connect community um, with uh, with one another. That's a little bit harder. And maybe technology could be something we we could lean on. Um, 
I'm thinking that if we're in a blended scenario, which I know lots of places are considering kind of in school sometimes and online sometimes, for me, my focus when those kids are with me is going to be that community. Yes. <laughs> Amy? I guess I'm wondering um, for the SEL aspect of it, how much the schools would loop like teachers in the beginning of the year uh, or, or even the same class if that it is all possible. A, a naive question. I don't think we have the answers today, but I'm, I'm just wondering if they would. They would consider doing that because of the comfort level that. I have heard of some schools, particularly elementary doing that. Tara, did you want to comment? Yeah, I think like the common thread that I'm hearing is just how important that for me, the communication is going to be. Um, you know, if we're not looping that I'm communicating with the teachers that I'm, I'm sending my kids to um, that we're, we're really making sure that we are communicating with home and with our students and, and all of those pieces so that you know that that idea that that we are getting to know our kids across um, across settings, and so we want to we want to talk to the other people that know them, um, and we want to talk to them about you know who you are as learners. Certainly, that's something you know we've been talking to our grade eights about in these one to ones. Is is what have you learned about yourself as a learner this year? And how are you going to use that knowledge to self advocate for your learning needs going forward and giving them in those conferences some really like specific feedback about yeah you're right that is a way that you learn really well and here's some ways you can ask for that when you're going forward. Um, but so I think that communication piece is going to be so essential. Mike. Yeah, you know, I'm just to piggyback off of that. Um, you know, I, you talked about exit interviews, and I think that's a brilliant idea to to really hear what they have to say. And I think, I guess, to answer the next question, I think starting whatever the start looks like, I think investing that time to hear from them if it's a new teacher. Uh, but you know, instead of day one, here's my syllabus. Here's the you know this here's here's this tool, and, and to just right in to that without taking the time. Uh, you know, I think of it like an entrance interview almost. You know what I mean? On the other end. Um, that, that that new teacher, if they, if there is no looping, um, spends that time and invests in uh, the ki kids just want to be heard, um, and I think they have that assurance going in that regardless of uh, their past experience, because like Rob said, you know some some thrived and some struggled, and just to be able to kind of get the uh, get your finger on the pulse of what that looks like, uh, I think you know, regardless you'll be in better shape going forward. So this all uh, this conversation goes into my follow up question that I was just thinking about. So um, I was going to ask, how are you getting feedback from the students? And it sounds like I, I love the idea of an exit interview. I never thought about that or heard about that before. So I think that's great. Um, but for those of you who have maybe asked for feedback or if you haven't asked for feedback, how are you um, changing? And what's one thing maybe you would do differently if you had to do this all over again in an emergency situation, knowing what you know now, what's the one thing that you would do differently? Mary. Well, there, there were some things that went right and there were a lot of things that went wrong. <laughs> um, and you know, the, the things that went right were you know, the, the communicating. I mean, it, it was it was so essential to phone call, phone call, phone call, phone call, and, and follow up with the, the students that you weren't getting a response from and sending emails and sending more emails and sending remind messages. And, you know, so that, that communication piece um, was super critical. And um, so, you know, things that I did wrong, I mean, like maybe I didn't come across that realization soon enough. You know, we were we were sort of tossed into this and, and for us, we had, um, you know, like three days. Okay, boom, you, you have to distance teach, you know, here you go, off, off you go, off you go with you. You know, and it, it started off where, and I think a lot of teachers did this, I converted, I was desperate. It was like, okay, I have to convert PDFs and send off those PDFs to, you know, of, of worksheets. And it was worksheet this and worksheet that. And, and, you know, it was just kind of this scattered mess. And it wasn't until, you know, I had the time to sit and make an organized plan that I created 
less coming at the kids in in more organized fashion because they were super super confused when they were getting hit you know one assignment and one day one assignment another day one assignment another day and one thing was a pdf and one was a hyperdoc and the other one was a link to this another thing was look over here it was chaos like they couldn't find anything and i had to stop and reflect and be like why aren't they turning these things in you know what is causing it so you know having that gift of um you know retrospect now it definitely i i was able to start near the end of it packaging things differently you know i would do one mm -hmm. hyperdoc that hyperdoc had everything they needed for three weeks crazy too a lot of the kids would do it in three days you know <laughs> talk about that schedule they just hey this is what i have to do for three weeks i'm going to do it all today which is fine you know but um mm -hmm. that made a huge difference in the in you know communicating and getting things back from the kids that one stop shopping idea it sounds like um, Dan and then Nina. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is the ability to be able to plan moving forward made a big difference in your effectiveness and and what you were able to do and reflect on how the students were feeling. Yeah, time. You know, just having that time to to prepare. <clears throat> I really think that's a big difference between emergency remote teaching and remote teaching. Uh, go ahead, Dan. Um, being a teacher on Rotary, I did not have my homeroom class, so um, I ended up making phone calls. I called about 280 different homes and families just to touch base, um, to hear the kids' voices. Um, the stuff I was putting out um, wasn't being put up. Um, I had access to teacher student classroom, but I'm slowly, slowly, slowly dropping to the uh, bottom of all the all their classrooms. And I, I just, it, it, about a month and a half into it, I, I had to refocus and rethink on how I wanted to approach it. So I was contacting the teachers, you know, where are you heading next? Oh, with this and math, okay, then how about we combine our stuff together? So as a teacher on Rotary, it was a challenge to get the kids engaged because there were, there were times where the homeroom teacher says, focus on your math, focus on your language, focus on your science. If you have time, you can do the other stuff. And most of the, it was like, no, the weather's nice, I'm not gonna do the other stuff. So I was finding like hitting a dead wall every time so often, but you made those connections. And when you did make those connections and the kids did the work, it, it was a great like, wow, hallelujah type moment. So don't forget us rotary teachers. <laughs> <laughs> For us US folks, that's uh, specials. Thank you. I was sitting here going, a learning commons is a library. Um, a boot is a boat. So there you go. And there's process too, right? The process is different. Yeah, the process. Yeah. Go ahead, Nina. Um, I think the it's like again talking about religion and politics. You have to tread lightly when you talk to people. I remember talking to parents in this whole process that were vehemently opposed to this. They didn't feel like this is the type of learning for their kids, and they thought it was optional. So. Other parents wanted eight hours worth of learning every day. They wanted to structured like their kids were in in class. And then so you're you're fighting this battle of obviously I can't make everybody happy, nor is that my goal. It's really just trying to find a, a balance. And just like the kids like to work afternoon in that, it's again finding the best way to communicate with those parents. And it's not the same for everybody. Some were phone calls, some were emails, some were text messages. We know that the consistency piece is key on how they're going to do that, but um, how do how are we receptive to those parents so they are supporting us from home and and educated as much as they can be that learning remotely from home is not the same as an eight hour school day with your kids and you're putting all this pressure on them in some cases and it's backfiring and they're withdrawing from what we're what we're doing so really building up the trust with the parents which again is I think extremely difficult to do from from this virtual world but if it's going to be the new normal then we're going to have to find a way to do that and at the same time not make ourselves crazy in terms of this management piece of I have now 150 students plus 150 to 300 parents all weighing in on it. So I'm curious to see um, what we collectively come up with to, to best meet their needs too because again it's not the same for every family. Well I think building community is not just with the students it's with the parents as well. Yeah. I just love what you're saying because it kind of makes me feel better. You know, I, I had 
a lot of folk, my focus was social emotional learning. You know, I had four Google Meets a week and they were at scheduled times and I played games with the kids. You know, we, it was just about the bonding and, and you know, let's, let's come together as a class. And then we set aside maybe 10, 15 minutes for questions or for clarifications. And when I did that, I got all these complaints from parents that I wasn't teaching. They wanted the lecture. They wanted me talking and teaching on those video conferences. And then if you swing the other direction, there were many, many days where I felt like I was just making about, you know, 140 to 210 people angry. Usually it's only, you know, the 70 students that I teach, but now every lesson that I sent out made 210 people angry. You know, it, <laughs> I really couldn't, you know, find that balance. And so it's, it's, I guess it's nice to know that I'm not the only one. There really wasn't a happy medium uh, when it came to that. Derek and then Tara. Sorry, just to piggyback off what Mary was saying, Mary, what you did and like what your parents requested you to do, I was going to say was my biggest failure at first. Trying to teach the way I did in the physical space and just digitize it was not working for my kids because I'm not, I don't have the same intonation and it, like it's not the same experience. And I was trying to replicate it in an impossible scenario and I had people checking out. So the one things that were working and where I like rectified that was sending out weekly forms to check in on just sounds so simple. How are you doing and what can I help you with? And honestly, the things that were coming in there from students, when I started asking that, I my Google Meet started skyrocketing. And then I did, I think it was Aaron who said earlier, I just called them conferences and I said, book me in for a conference anytime, one-on-one, -on -one, bring your families, bring your siblings. And Mary, what you were saying about playing games and having conversations, I had the most authentic learning experiences in those moments where they even let their guard down because there's no one else on the call, it's us. And I could feel it more there. It was so authentic and true and real. And that was like, to me, the best learning that like, and to be honest for me, probably one of the best teaching that I've ever had to do. And it looked different and it's not all curricular is what I would say. And getting them to really try to believe in themselves as a student, even without like us as teachers moving forward, like trying to transcend what they even think about themselves and what they're capable of. So, I think it's awesome and I'm totally with you. And that, and an, that anonymity is not possible in a physical classroom. Even if you're doing one-on-one -on -one conferences with the kids, they're all around them. Their peers are there. They know that they, they aren't doing it. So they really can be authentic when nobody's going to judge me. It's just me and my teacher. Tara, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really, the two things, like I just keep hearing is, is that communication piece with, and I, I just think how important that relationship with home um, has been brought to to highlight because we can't just think about well I'm doing this at school and if the parents aren't on board it doesn't matter to me because I've got them here for these eight hours and I can do what I know is best right and you bring the families on board we have to communicate we have to look at the whole child and that means letting the parents on the team. Um, and and that's my experience with so many of our families that I, I work that I've worked with is they don't they don't want to run the show but they want to be on the team and, and letting letting them in and listening and and being open to hearing that what I'm doing isn't working is so important because it if I'm not willing to hear that I can't do better I have to be willing to hear that and 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 that means sometimes then parents are going to be critical of me. Um, and and I think it's too easy when we're in the school to just shut our classroom doors to that criticism from home and be like, you know, you're not a teacher. You don't know. Um, and, and that's something that really has come, I think, into reliefs into such stark relief in this setting is how important that is. And and then the other one I was going to say is. Being a team, you know, we're really fortunate. Erin and I work really closely together, and we we work with an amazing grade eight team. Um, and we were we were a pretty tight team before this. We've gotten a lot tight since this. Um, mm -hmm. We joke that we're probably the only team still meeting every day. Um, that, you know, we connect with each other. But a big part of that is that that we want to work smarter, not harder. And so. How can we share the load? Um, and and those specialist teachers that you know, Dan was saying, you know, our band teacher who no longer has a band program, um, he's he's 
joined teams and, and we've looked at how can we share this load and work together so that we're connecting with our students, but we're not in our silos anymore. And, and that's something I want to see keep going. Go ahead, Rob. That's one thing I would really love to see as a, an involvement of leadership is looking at, especially in these situations, how do you continue to build on that team? Like as, as a principal or administrator of a school, like how are we, what are we doing to encourage that, that cultivating of like this team philosophy and helping each other out and, and working together? Like, you know, I think like, I think that should be a, a, a more and more of a focus, especially coming out of what we came out with. We saw that these teams were developing and starting to form, but if as leadership, we could actually really support that and, and, and help that and promote that, I think, I think it would help everyone across the board. Sometimes, you know, especially when what, what we do, there's three of us that do our jobs with say 3,000 teachers. It's just like what we found or some schools were saying, let's have pockets of people that have expertise and working and kind of building that capacity. So I think when we think of those teams within a school, I think if those leaders and those leadership roles really should be focusing on how do they, how do they help promote that and make that happen? And I think that will, that will have a huge impact on teacher and student in the long run. What I hear you saying is social emotional learning for teachers um, and for administrators as well. And we did find that um, we ran a couple sessions um, and we had some of the highest attendance out of everything we offered um, for support for teachers. Um, you know, this is difficult for all of us and we all need that support. So building those communities um, um, amongst each other is important too. Mary, did you want to add to that? Well, it, it was like the wild west of teaching, you know, when, when we first started <laughs> off, like, I had no idea what I was doing. I'm just going to like, no, I need to figure it out, you know, and, and there wasn't that support system. I had, you know, another science teacher and we parallel teach, you know, and so I'd be like, well, you know, here, let's do this. She's like, okay, you know, we'll do this. We didn't, we didn't know if we were doing it right. We didn't know, you know, anything. And, and so yeah, definitely it would have been it's so much more helpful to have had that support system or a network of people that I could just talk to and say, you know, how are you doing this? Even the grading, you know, the grading was kind of like uh, one week I'd say, okay, we're going to do it this way. And then the next week we're going to do it this way. And then nobody, you know, just this whole week, you know, having enough guidance. And, and so administrators too um, really need to be part of that uh, in terms of the communication. We didn't have a single faculty meeting, not one in you know the entire time period that we were distance teaching you know oops that was kind of an important thing to have happen so um yeah don't don't leave us and at, the same, at the same time like you said we were meeting regularly and nobody was directing us to do it like we didn't need to be watched over to say hey this is what's happening and we were meeting as we needed some days it was twice a week or sometimes it was five times a week depending on what we needed and again, this whole like holding on to the micromanage, let us go. We will we'll do a really great job. And if not, then then intervene. Yeah. Mike, you're there. Can I say that? I think there's a balance between micromanaging <laughs> and scaffolding for success, though, right? Like I, I don't when I say that, I don't I don't think it's like contrived collegiality where we're like we're putting teams together just to put teams together. I think there's there's a there's a way to do it in that you're like just encouraging people to work together I, I, it's not that i think they should micromanage it i think that they should really it should just be built into culture the fabric of the school in terms of a more like um more of just how we do things in this building not that you guys are going to work together or you guys are going to get work together i think i think we like, i think uh, mel was right is that sometimes we're, we're always using all these skills like differentiation and and we're worried about leaving students behind and all these things but we have to have that take that exact same approach with teachers. Teachers, there's some that feel totally left behind in this process. There's some that have some major mental health issues going on. And it, it, it's like, you know, who, who's taking care of those people? Who's, who's making sure that those people are supported or connecting those people to other people that could maybe um, help them through that time? Because in the long run, if you don't do that, you're impacting entire groups of students if the teacher's not um, in the position that they need to be mentally, emotionally, um, it's definitely um, something that we need to look at.
It's hard to keep your kids quiet and mute and moderate all of this. We have this. It doesn't seem to be working right now. Please do not disturb. And, I, and you'll, you'll notice me smile every time, Mary, someone walks in your room, Tara, you're slipping your son walk in. I'm like, that makes me happy, though. Like, this is how we are teaching. And sometimes I think people forget that, that this is a stressor for everyone who's got people walking in because I'm sure, like, I feel anxiety, I'm like, shh, quiet, I'm having a conference that's being taped right now, and the dog is over behind me, and I'm like, it's stressful just as a normal living situation, let alone a teaching situation. So, Mike, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, and no, I was just to chime in. Um, I heard Tara say, you know, like, work smarter, not hard. And I heard Mary talking about, you know, being able to lean on someone and maybe not knowing if you were doing it right, but, you know, still pushing through and trying new things. and. Um, I know as a tech integrator, um, you know, for me, another, you know, trying to find ways to work smarter, I suppose, and maybe setting more boundaries and finding a community to lean on, even if it's outside of your school, I find that that's been uh, super helpful. You know, I know this is called the TIFF Summit, and we have the Technology Integrators Forum, and to be able to have those communities or, or in whatever communities of practice you're in, um, that, that was super helpful to me. So, because of what I would do the same, definitely try to find the people. That has been huge. Um, and, you know, maybe what I would do differently is, is potentially try to set some more boundaries in terms of like what it looks like during the day, because this, the whole thing just got kind of turned upside down, you know, to, uh, just like we were saying how the students like the flexible, flexible schedule and how that benefited them at the same time, trying to help, uh, support teachers when they needed it, uh, when they were working, you know, and that's sometimes that didn't happen at, um, between the hours of seven 30 and three 30. It, you know, it, it happens at five o'clock at night or seven or eight o'clock at night. So, and trying to balance all of that. Um, so just trying to, I guess, constantly grow and do better in those areas. And um, it's something that I guess I would, you know, as a, as a coach or an integrator, try to think about what I might try to do differently. Um, that's something I've thought about. Tara. Yeah, I, I too have a do not enter sign that's super effective <laughs> on my door, <laughs> as you can see. Um, but the, I think just listening to you guys, it's kind of bringing to, into my mind how fortunate we were um, where we are um, in, in what we would do differently. A lot of the things that you guys are kind of touching on, we were fortunate enough to have happen this round. So just from a timing perspective, um, when the schools closed here was um, the, like three days before we went out on our week long spring break. Mm -hmm. um, and so our system um, essentially said, do what you can do for these three days, and we're going to take spring break to come up with a plan. And, and, and teachers will not be available over spring break, and teachers, you're going to go on spring break, and, and, and we will come up with a plan. Um, and so when we came back, we, we had a plan. Um, it was, it was, you know, emergency online learning, um, but, but there was kind of a system direction and there was a chance to put a little bit of thought into it. And, and even for teachers, we had that week to kind of wrap our brains around what was, this was going to look like and, and how we were going to move forward. And, and so all of that, that a little bit of breathing room that, you know, it sounds like not everybody got, um, was hugely beneficial <laughs> for us. Um, and, and from that system perspective too, too, Mike, when you're talking um, multiple communication channels. So, you know, our tech specialists at a system level, um, you know, were, have been super responsive to us, but across channel. And, and one of the first things we did in a system was set up those pods within schools. You know, who wants to be um, a go-to specialist in this, in their school? So that you know, it wasn't all on one person, and then there was trickle down, and and so some really good things like that that I think definitely to do again. Um, you know, I sort of say to other systems, pause, just hit pause before you jump online if we're in an emergency situation again. So here's what I really like, and you know, you have the right panel. I'm pretty sure we've only asked 1.5 questions. <laughs> So that's when you know we you're We were both like two hours. Two hours. We're gonna, now we're going to get through this. We're not even asking questions anymore. This is what a <laughs> panel should be in just conversation. So. But the other thing I was thinking uh, in addition to that was I did not mean for my question to be negative. Um, 
I was hoping that, you know, we could talk about our growth and, and moving forward, but I love that you all said, well, here's what went right. And here's what I would do differently. So I, I love that you all responded that way and, and appreciate that. All right, should we get to a brand new question? <laughs> hey, Mel, there was a comment in the chat about uh, homeschooling. So um, Andrew McDonald wrote, it would be interesting to see how the homeschooling network did during this time. Um, they're missing their, their daughter homeschools and they didn't miss a beat. So yeah. I, I was in the, the chat. Thanks, Andy. Yes, please. Anyone who is with us, um, any questions that you want to ask the panel, please put that into the chat. Um, we would happy to include that. Um, and any back channel, any chat that you want to do, feel free. It also makes me think, like, how does the homeschooling landscape, not landscape change, but will more people maybe try to take that approach going forward? Who knows? You know what I mean? I'd be interested to see the different effects that it has on homeschooling in general going forward. There was actually um, a USA Today poll that went out two or three weeks ago, and 30% of the parents said that they may keep their kids home, depending on what the school decides to do and how they, they move forward. So I definitely think there are people who are thinking about that. Mel, I'd also like you to forward this video to all higher ed because they're about 18 steps behind us and what's going on. I have so many um, seniors that I've been in contact with that are now taking semesters off because they're like, we can't handle going away to college, paying all this money and not getting a proper education because their educators have not been educated in, in mm -hmm. teaching. So um, I think that's an important concept too. Like that, that's a whole different story that maybe that will, um, create even more of a bridge between K-12 and, and higher ed. Absolutely, for sure. Do you wanna ask the next question or want me to? No, it's your turn. I asked the one an hour ago. <laughs> I asked the follow-up. <laughs> All right. Um, how about we talk about who influences you? Who do you follow on Twitter? Uh, what podcast do you listen to? Who is your most influential educator it could be technology it could be pedagogy it could be anything in between um who influenced you who inspires you kyle kitchen <laughs> i'm actually not even lying to be honest <laughs> he does uh you get to work with a guy like that every day who pushes your thinking pushes himself you know he's he's really being like a couple steps ahead all the way in this process so like just having that guy daily in your in your room it's like it's unbelievable kyle like I, I i really like i felt like i've grown under your leadership so thanks buddy i truly uh, uh truly love that i'll i'll deliver your payment later thank you <laughs> <laughs> dan just to piggyback on what rob said kyle is a huge supporter and an influence on what we do in class Nothing I, I love more than working with him. Um, I, I have an opportunity a couple times a year to sit down and we have a, a, a day of STEM at our school and to take a day off and just to throw things and bounce ideas off each other's head and how's it going to look and how's it going to work. It's been awesome. I think I, I first time I met Kyle was about five, maybe six years ago, and it's been an awesome experience. So uh, having a someone like that to be able to call upon, either text on the phone or a quick email, He's so like right back and, and just encouraging and giving some great feedback and guidelines and direction on what to do. He's been awesome. <laughs> All right, to kind of talk about that, I don't think it's the Kyle Kitchen per se. It's I think it's about having that person. Like I'm envious of Aaron and Tara. Having that person that you can talk to at a moment's whim, it could be like, I'm having a tough day. It could be, hey, I have this idea. And sometimes I think my greatest thing with, and there's a lot of people like, and Derek knows the most, I think. I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Please help me. And I reach out. And to have that person bounce ideas and say, no, no, you're overthinking this. Or no, 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 like, why don't you try this? I think that's, you know, I, I super appreciate Rob and Dan. They are like, you know, my best friends too. But having that person that you can go to to bounce ideas off of, and just to kind of, you know, we used to have a lot of PLCs, you know, where we came together as teams and just the best times, it wasn't like, okay, we need to make this. It was about like a, 
what what should we do? What are your thoughts? And listening to each other and having that time as educators, because I don't think we get that anymore. Like to actually imagine sitting down in a staff meeting just to talk, not necessarily having an agenda saying, check, check, assessment, check, check, this came out, check. But to say, you know, Nina, how are things going in your class? I know you're doing the consortium coming up. How are your kids doing? And just having a conversation that doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a virtual happy hour after work, because I think that's where some of our best learning comes from. That's why we go to conferences to talk to people. So that's just my spiel. It's it's not, these guys are awesome. I learned from them just as mm -hmm. much as I, I try and talk it too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tara and then, yeah, Mary. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, you all should be jealous of me for getting to work with <laughs> You all wanna work with her too. So, but I think that's, that was something that our our grade eight team realized really early on in this process was, you know, though we start our days with our, our morning team meeting and we realized really early on that even when we didn't have anything to meet about, we all sort of said we still wanted to meet because we'd start off with that kind of social conversation and end up in these just really rich pedagogical conversations where we were talking about you know, our students and our learning and, and the work that we were doing. And we all recognized really early on what a gift that was in this context, because there there's never a, a, a school day when we're not online where we're like, hey, let's sit down and have a coffee together for half an hour at the start of the day, right? We're all lined up for the photocopier and we're <laughs> running in the door and meeting with students and, and all of that. And so that just, time to talk to each other and and get to know each other as people and then also as educators and professionals has has been a huge gift that we we have just embraced in our team mary and then nina um, yeah, so um, I don't want to ruin the, the Kyle kitchen love fest. Please don't ruin it. <laughs> ruin it. Just take it. Stop Actually, on it. You're fine. I'm going to answer the, the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of conversations with people about, you know, drinking from the EdTech Kool-Aid for like eight, ten years. And then, you know, we were tossed into distance, distance learning. And then suddenly everybody wanted to know what I knew. And I'm like, well, you should have listened to me ten years ago. <laughs> um, but um, in terms of, you know, tools that were really helpful, it was kind of, funny, but honestly, taking the Google certification course. Now, I, I took it years ago, and I only took it because I wanted, you know, the little badge on my <laughs> email tag line, <laughs> but I did it. And, um, but because we're a GAF school and we use so many, you know, Google applications, it was great being able to just suddenly use all that knowledge. Um, and a good example is something Derek referred to just a few minutes ago. I had never had any reason to set up a Google appointment slot in a calendar. It's a skill you have to know for Google 2 certification, but I really had no reason to use it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, you know what? I can set up appointment slots. The kids can pick an appointment slot for a Google Meet and bam, it was like, yes. So it was suddenly, you know, really, I was really, really happy that I had taken that certification. So I think that's one thing I would recommend for people. <laughs> The other one is, um, I don't know if anybody else, but I totally jumped on the Bitmoji bandwagon just because <laughs> it made teaching fun. It made things cute and I just needed something else to kind of liven things up. So, you know, those were those were two little things that were just helpful for distance teaching. Mel, Mel, I don't know if you're really there. We can't see it. We are we're we're laughing. <laughs> Can you still hear us? I'm like, we're frozen. <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. At least I'm smiling. I look half decent <laughs> somewhat. Yeah, good for me. Um, <laughs> someone that inspires me that I started following a few years ago is Monty Series out uh, in Washington, I believe. Um, and he's where I learned smiles and frowns from. But he also um, has a blog, a, a daily blog. It's 180 days. Um, and what I love about him and what I love about um, like the consortiums that I'm a part of right now is that, and Mel, you just referred to it, like even though there was not a negative approach to what we were saying, there was like a real realism there. Like nobody's just complaining for the sake of complaining and saying this can't be fixed or whatever, but people are being real. Like he was really honest in his blog of like, this is hard for me. This is not the same. Please don't tell me that this is the same as being with my kids. So um, with the intent of, 
do reflect and do better. Like we can do better at what we're doing and we're being really um, productive in the things that we're focusing on if they are negative. So that support group of, again, finding your marigolds, finding the people around you who will connect with you, whether, like Mike said, that might not be in your school. That might be in these consortiums or these panels where we're meeting to just say, these are my people. Like, this is who I need to be with. Although we're addressing the things that need some help, we're doing it from a lens of, I'm not just going to be at a faculty meeting complaining and just saying, well, my kids didn't log in and didn't sign in. Too bad. They're, they're missing out. So um, I feel like I've been inspired but it's again through a real lens, not this fictitious lens of everything is positive and wonderful and, and okay too. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, chime in and add like for me, uh, I mean, I'm a consumer. I'm always trying to learn from others. So I would say I've been inspired by really actions in a blog. They put out a podcast. They created some piece of content. I mean, I, I just think like Eric Kurtz and some of the stuff that you know, that he put out during this yeah. time was a huge help to me, and that that could go and help my teachers. Um, so you know, I think you know, Rob had authored a book. You know, like books that I can digest over the summer in a, in a book study, things like that. Basically, I just anyone that has put themselves out there through a piece of content, through reflection on a tweet, that like you said, that authentic voice that Monty provides and people like that has been really helpful. But I also get to give a shout out to the content creators and the people that, um, you know, I'm guilty of doing more consuming than creating myself. Um, but, but I'm grateful to learn from people that, that put themselves out there in that way. Tara. Oh, I just want to add that um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed, Michael, what you said, I'm guilty of consuming more than I create. Um, it sums up me. I'm I'm very much a lurker in like all the <laughs> Facebook groups and Twitter chats and all of those things. Um, but this this has also encouraged me to to you know participate in those conversations. And um, one is um, for for me that's been really great. Um, Aaron is a moderator in a, a design thinking weekly Twitter um, chat. Um, and uh, and it's been really um, I've I've started participating in it more and it, it's educators from all over and and it's been really um, exciting for me to get to to hear some of those voices and participate in that so I think that's also pushing me a little bit more to not just learn but actually share. <laughs> Aaron, if you want to put that Twitter group in the chat, I, I know I do like myself some design thinking, so I would love to yeah. be part I of that. I'd love to have people join us. It's ha the hashtag is DTK12 chat. So design okay. thinking K to 12 chat. And it's a wonderful community of, of educators um, across uh, North America and across the globe who um, think about the role that design thinking plays in education. And um, we have a a weekly kind of chat on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, and we'd love for you to join us. Awesome, amazing, thank you. <laughs> I think that's another way to add to what we were just talking about, having people to bounce ideas off and, and talk with, and that's a great way to take that globally, really, you know, it, it breaks down all those walls and time and location. Um, I'm going to throw two more names out there real quick. I'm sure everybody knows or whatever. Jen Gonzalez at Cult of Pedagogy, who Melanie has been in contact with, and I'm beyond jealous. <laughs> um, and Brene Brown, and especially right now with everything that's going on in, in the world and country, she's been really studying vulnerability and this whole idea of owning your own story and our history and all of that. And again, that's going to be my theme for next year is this storytelling that we all have stories to tell and they're important and worth saying and hearing and getting out there so that we can. And Tara, you're right. Like the, the lurker piece sometimes comes back down to just your own, um, like, I don't know if I want to put that out there, being brave enough to put out there what you do and know that there may be some trolls and people behind the scenes saying negative things, but if I really believe it and own it. So, her work has been really, really inspirational um, to me, and and I feel like she's going to be a leader as we kind of navigate what we're what we're up against. Erin, did you want to add to that? 
Yeah, I just wanted to, um, one of the quotes that I often repeat and Tara will roll her eyes is what's obvious to you is amazing to someone else. And so what you know <laughs> is worth sharing. Um, I just wanted to throw one more name out there too, um, to add to Nina's list. Um, Angela Stockman, who some of you might know, <laughs> how Melanie and I connected through Angela's Facebook group. Um, building Better Writers, but she has a new book coming out in September, which Tara and I are featured in, um, called Creating Inclusive Writing Environments in K-12. to And it's all about kind of um, this concept of resistance. And I think it has a lot of connections to it, to these conversations we've been having about equity and access and why are kids not engaging um, that goes beyond writing. So I would add that one. I just got to add one more too. Uh, from a global perspective, um, one of my friends, uh, he teaches in Ghana at LNN Memorial Academy. And when COVID hit um, at his school, um, they were already struggling for access. I mean, they would be using his phone essentially as a hotspot to try to get them. So like, I think about like the rest of the world. Um, I, I, I've done some, a little bit of work with like the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And I, I think about like, I don't know, this, this experience also has me thinking on a global scale about some of those other schools. I mean, we talk about access and equity. So um, you know, how are, and I think about like, what are ways our students can learn with the world and in what other ways can we help in those ways? So, um, you know, that just, just a thought and reflecting on this whole experience, uh, looking at it through our lens, but also trying to look at it on the global lens of like what it means, like, you know, for education for the world, um, you know, and how can we maybe help others? Uh, when I, you know, I think about the global goals and I think about SDG4 and quality education, um, you know, I've heard the word empathy come up in this conversation throughout a couple, a couple times on this panel, things like that. So I think sometimes being connected with, with teachers from other parts of the world can all gain the perspective on, on things that are happening in, in our world as well. Any others? Oh my gosh, we're going to move to another question. Crazy. <laughs> all right. So. And it's, the fun thing is I don't run all the questions by my wife, which we know is a horrible thing to do, but it's going to happen. So this is, uh, it's definitely TIFF related, but it's also open to be anything. Um, I just want to hear to lighten things up a little bit too. Is there any lesson moment? It doesn't have to be the last three months, but anything that you've done or your students have done that was like your aha moment or like the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. That's amazing. I'm going to remember this forever. Um, and you thought, this is why I'm an educator. You know, just, it's not a loaded question at all, but take a second to think about it. Do you have any of those moments that you know, like I know a couple that pop out in my mind. <laughs> and so like, do you have any of those moments that you just share with everybody just to like, yeah, this is why we're educators. It's just not about like the situation we're in now with remote learning. It's just, this is why I am a teacher. And I like you looking around the room mm -hmm. and thinking, huh, there's a lot to choose from. <clears throat> Mike, did you have your hand up? Yeah, and I did. Cat? Yeah, uh, but for me, um, connected to all of this, I think about like the class of 2020 and how this looks so much different from them, uh, uh, for them. And uh, we had a chance to do uh, an adopt a senior program. So it was, a, it was an opportunity to adopt a couple of seniors. So I adopted a couple of seniors and like to, to drive to their house, to deliver some gifts to them and the, to brighten their day. It was really kind of a neat experience for me. Um, you know, I, and they said that, you know, like just the, the, the gratitude from the families um, and what it looked like for them. I mean, I, I remember, uh, you know, the last class I actually taught in the classroom, I taught 10 years, eighth grade math. Um, they graduated already. So I hadn't had these uh, students, but one of the kids I actually had in Minecraft club when he was in uh, grade eight. So it was kind of cool and he's going for IT. And so we, I had just, they had like nice conversations with these kids um, about the future to give them some reassurances. I know we made a, a flip grid for the class of 2020, which I thought was great. Um, you know, those are some neat moments, um, you know, for me, uh, not even aside from just helping teachers, it was like, this was really special to be able to just have those connections uh, made me feel <laughs> really good for the class of 2020 because it wasn't the ideal way for them to end their school year. So. Tara, Rob, then Mary. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think for me, Aaron and I have mentioned a few times these one-to-one -one conferences that we've been doing with students. Um, 
but we um, end our year um, with a project where um, we have our grade eight students. A lot of our, our curricular focus in grade eight, social studies out here is around worldviews. Um, and so we have the students end their year with a project where they create their own manifesto, their own statement of beliefs and call to action. And um, in some, however they would like that to look. Um, and, and we've been talking to the kids about that work and, and we were doing a lot of, of uh, work leading up to that project and having some amazing small group conferences with students um, around um, the big questions of philosophy. What does it mean to live a good life? And, and what do you think, um, think about that? And, and hearing what those students have had to say and, um, and the thoughtfulness and the consideration that they, they have for their own lives and, and for their role in our world um, has just been incredible and, and such a, 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 a great thing in this time to get to have that time to talk to them. Rob? Yeah, mine's actually more on a personal basis. Like I feel more connected to my kids learning than ever before in my house. Like, you know, like this has been, um, I would say like the highlight for me or the aha moment was just, you know, my daughter's got a genius hour project going right now. And she's like, she decided she's going to do it on green screening and, you know, taking her through everything from where the power goes into the camera to what an SD card is to what a micro SD card is. To, and now she's fully green screening. She's full. She's running Final Cut Pro like a champ. She's cutting videos up for my wife. And, you know, it, it's it's one of those things like you have a busy job and you're, you're doing this all the time. But, you know, I'm like, why I could be doing this all the time i just was I, I think sometimes as a parent my aha moment was just, you know i'm leaving education up to the teacher and you know maybe because i am a teacher is like when i get home i'm not looking to do it and i'm like i'm losing out on that like i'm i'm the one losing out i'm losing out on the fulfillment the relationship my daughter and i are so close she it was so funny she calls me up a couple minutes ago and she goes like well she calls me up before this and she says dad check out this and she shows me she green screen something and in the video when she says watch when they say lights on and then this light flicks on in the background and she's and i'm just like and i'm like geez and then my son is in french immersion he has to write these French journals every day and sitting down with him and getting to understand him as a learner has been an absolute blessing because I feel like I know my kids better on a real personal level. So I hope that that's what a lot of parents get. Like, I hope that's what is going on is people really get to understand their kids. And so when we get back to teaching and they can actually connect with those, the parents will say, yeah, I was struggling with the same thing. And maybe there'll be some like um, more understanding between well, like the teachers and the parents and how how those kids are functioning and hopefully we can use that to get a little bit better but yeah working with my kids is is the, the highlight for me mary wow that's awesome rob um so i have two two that one of kyle you are absolutely going to love um <laughs> as i mentioned before a lot of my video meetings with the students were were pretty much you know just about getting to know you and having conversations and things like that. And like a lot of teachers, we would do the, um, you know, show me your pet moment where you get <laughs> households of horrified pets as the kids are running after them and grabbing them and, you know, look at the camera, look at the camera. Um, and, you know, so they could almost anticipate that I was gonna do this most most weeks. And um, one little boy had gotten some baby ducks and he knew that I was gonna ask them to show me something. And uh, he was ready because he was sitting in his garage with his Chromebook. And he's like, Mrs. Howard, I have something to show you. And, you know, the kids were all excited to see the baby ducks. And he said, but one of my ducks has a bad leg. So I'm going to use the 3D printer to design a wheel for the duck <laughs> so that it can, you know, be mobile. And it was like, oh, my gosh. Like, he could not wait to tell me that. You know, like, that was his little moment. And he was one that was actually failing going into distance learning before this all happened. And to see him thrive, that was a pretty cool thing. You know, to see that. Awesome. Unfortunately, the duck died. So that's the best <laughs> thing. <laughs> so now we're going to 3D print the entire duck, Mary. I'm yeah, pretty, pretty excited about the duck 3D pretty project. So that made me really happy. Uh, um, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Mary. 
the second little story was was actually the the way this this all ended the school year ended uh, i'm a science teacher physical science and we were studying waves and uh kind of a, on a whim i'm like you know hey we'll do a flip grid you know if you know what flip grid is the students make these little videos or whatever and um the directions were pretty simple show me a wave at your house and tell me what type of wave it is you know and the examples i gave were like you know take a rope or take a hose or something and, and demonstrate a wave and then I clicked, you know, send, you know, send the assignment out. Let's see what happened. And about 40 kids showed me videos of them jumping into their pool because it's the end of school and everything. And <laughs> coming. So it was kind of awesome just to kind of like, I just sit there and smile, just one after the other. You know, here we go. You're going to see the cannonball. What are going to do? Jump and do a cannonball. And it was like, yeah, that was pretty cool. So those are my two stories. Awesome. Oh, I love that. Um, Nina and then Amy. Uh, mine is less of an aha moment of just kind of um, encouragement. We know as teachers, sometimes we, we don't hear back from our students as much as we want in terms of just feedback. And as the school year wrapped up and again, being so distant, I got three separate messages from, from students. Um, one um, of which who is not going to our school next year, he's going to a private school. Um, and two other young ladies who are part of my innovation experience. And um, what I love so much about the messages that they sent was I could see and feel the things that we did in innovation come out in those messages. They were almost giving me like feedback in the message as to like the impact that I made and how important gratitude is and what a difference. And they were so specific um, in it. It was this common theme of we see how crazy busy you are and what you do, but it doesn't matter because when we're with you, we feel like you are um, so personalized and, and know us so well. So to hear that like instantly i'm like gonna start crying now to hear that right from the students like i feel like i'm pushing that out but you don't know sometimes so to get that back from the students and to know that what i'm doing really is making an impact not on the standard that i'm teaching or whatever but that these kids are going to move forward and did it so just unprompted they did it wasn't like we were signing yearbooks and they told me a little message like they went out of their way to really say like thank you for what you're doing so that makes me encouraged when these tough moments are, are happening to go, nope, it, it is getting through and just keep staying the course that, that you're making a lasting impression, so. Amy? Um, mine, again, is more like a social emotional um, aspect of adults. Uh, going back to what you were uh, talking about earlier, Kyle, I give a little background story. I run the arts and music forums uh, for my area for 27 districts. So they send um, one art or one music teacher to each of these forums. I disseminate uh, statewide updates and it's very structured. Uh, since COVID began, I uh, took uh, the opportunity to send out invitations and we just called it like a coffee chat where you could just come in and talk to each other. There was, I think a couple in the beginning anticipated some other kind of, you know, formal, this is the talking points, but we all just came in and had genuine conversations. Um, my Canadian friends, I did special subjects. So I did the physical education teachers and learned not to call gym teachers, physical education teachers, <laughs> um, CTE teachers. And it was just a safe place for them uh, to, uh, articulate what their needs are and bounce ideas off of each other. And it was very authentic, genuine conversation because there was no agenda. Um, it got to the point where the groups were really big. We did breakout rooms. And then as I think they felt more comfortable with what was going on, I know the groups got smaller, um, but it was to the point where I was like, all right, my music group, I'm like, I need to eat lunch before my next one. You guys could continue talking. I'm going to go eat and I would blank my screen and put it on mute. And it would be so fun to hear them carry on these conversations without me even being anywhere near my computer. So, um, Although, and I get to see their kids and their aunt and adults are just as awesome. They're like, here's my duck, you know, they're <laughs> just genuine. So when you go from a forum where it's more formal and yes, we do talk, but then you're invited in their homes and you just form this awesome connection and it's not structured and you could just be humans. It's just, I, if there's one thing moving forward from this, that is where I, I hope that we can just go back to the human capacity of why we're doing this and that we're not always hitting every single state. Well, not that we shouldn't hit the standards, but it is, it is the human connection first. So mm -hmm. Derek. 
Yeah, um, I kind of am going to, I resonate a lot with Rob's post uh, and what he said, because I have a just turned four year old and a one year old. Um, and when anyone knows me, I've been in different roles. We've been traveling the last few years all the time. And when I, like when COVID first struck, you saw all the negative and we're all hearing the things like teachers aren't doing and the difficult situations that so many have been put within. But within that, I wanted to focus on seeing the silver lining and just on a personal level for me, I've never had the same opportunity to like work with my kids at that rate. And that was like so awesome and surreal. So that part I get, and it, I think it means everything. And that'll be something like in my life beyond this, that I'll never forget. But in addition, I do teach um, higher ed and I teach future teachers. And uh, one of the coolest thing for me has not been anything that I did, but their excitement of for the first time, not even being with an associate, but doing one-on-one -on -one teaching online and going through failure and overcoming that and getting that first reaction and saying to me and like calling me like through multiple attempts, I finally connected with so-and-so. And then like breaking down emotional, like this is everything that I came to be a teacher. Like this is the, the moment of what, like what I was waiting for and to achieve and like, remembering what it was like to live that and now getting the opportunity to live vicariously through them through like their most like happy moments and like them achieving like some type of standard of what they think like that I made it kind of feeling is super surreal and I'm grateful to have that opportunity and I think it's like awesome to celebrate the positives that are still coming out from this time too and imagine being like a future teacher in this time now like you're overcoming so many hardships so that's been huge and I think they deserve a world of credit be honest i can't imagine i know it was difficult for me when it was uh the best of times and they're like excelling in so many ways so i'm just really proud of them so here i'll do my random aha moment i'm not even in this i'm just jumping in because that's what i do I'm, i apologize to my wife who lives with me um my favorite moment of the last few months actually has nothing to do with my school district or my IT for learning consultant. For some of you who may know me, I, I can kind of consider myself a maker at heart. And my favorite moments in the last three months was I created this weird English character who wears cardboard and adds gears called Fosbot. He has a British accent. So for no reason whatsoever, except for missing the creativity, because in my role, I just don't do teacher PD. We are in the classes. You, we're vampires. You invite us into the room. And we work with students and my thing is maker and creativity. So I just issued a global challenge of find items in your house. Do not buy anything new. And I want you to create something and share it with me. That was it. And unfortunately for my family, they literally helped me make a slow motion video of throwing cardboard on me, sending out challenges. But I got responses from across the world. And I'm going to say right away, it was selfish because I was missing creativity of kids and i think that's one thing i'm taking away that even though i'm the technology consultant and I, dan can attest to this the minute we took the tech out a little bit and we used the tech to deliver those kids wanted hands-on again they wanted to build they wanted to create and explore and that's you know that's what design thinking is you know we went from an empathetic moment to guess what i don't have the latest coding gear at home but i got toilet paper rolls what can you make? What can you give? And that was my happy moment. As I say, as Fazo, I'm like you, but happiness in my heart. And like, that's the accent. Deal with it. I know it's horrible. But like, the letters I got from parents was amazing to say thank you for including my child in something super creative. And they've gotten, uh, they're coming back around realizing that they can do this to show their learning. And, and I know Dan did an amazing couple maker challenges, design shoes, things like that. And from what I'm seeing and hearing from him that, and Dan, you should really tell a story, but like the amount of response he got by kind of flipping the delivery. Yep, we're all, we gotta do remote learning tech, but the tech can just be the delivery. I want you to still create and be creative. I think that's a big thing for me that I'm trying to impose in teachers I talk to that this can still happen. Kids are creative and you got to make sure you account for the tech side, sure, for delivery, but like let them build, let them create. So that's kind of my, that was my big aha moment in the last couple of months, just seeing the happiness that kids had to show and present. And I'm like, ooh, look, there's letter C, there's math. Like, sure, the teacher brain went, but like they were doing everything that I could ask them to do through creativity and making. So that was, that was my happy moment. Anyone else? 
I'm trying to think of a really smart response to that, but I'm not going to. Eight hours it took me to do one green screen movie with Fozbottom, and it was worth every <laughs> cardboard in the garage, sweaty moment. It was rough, but it was so rewarding. <laughs> and I love those. I love those videos. Every time I see one of those pop up, I'm like, I actually like, will agree like, I need to use this when I'm ready to watch it because it's like, I just want to enjoy it so much. So yeah, those Fozbottom ones are awesome. It was like I got to hop in a couple of uh, school flip grids and I got responses because Fosma would just come in and say, oh, I love what you're creating. Tell me about it. And all of a sudden, reply, reply, reply. Re I don't even know these kids. Reply, reply, because there's some weird guy with a movable cardboard hat. But it was just that inspiration piece. Like, it was pretty cool to see. He may or may not have scared Mike's child. I've, child asked, well. I've asked Mason <laughs> to like give me stuff for the month and I freaked him out the first day I could see it. I was so excited to talk to a child that I just scared him. <laughs> Nightmares for the rest of his life. Yep. It was one of his highlights of this entire time and he's been building up supplies. My wife keeps, keeps trying to clean off the recliner of all the supplies that he's been collecting to build his maker creation thanks to Fuzzbottom. So yeah, we're, we're <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming. <laughs> Um, all right, so my next question is, we started off the conversation, um, Dan, I think it was you that mentioned uh, talking about all these free resources that we have right now, um, the companies that have given us temporary access to their premium features for free, and, and that'll be coming to an end very quickly, so we have to make some decisions. Um, so I'm wondering, what do you think is going to give teachers and students the biggest bang for their buck? What is it, one tool, it could be free or not free, um, that you think will serve them well in, in the biggest area and the biggest way? Rob? Well, I'm not sure it's the biggest or biggest need, but I think there's definitely a need within us to allow kids to create with video and edit video and chop it up. And I look at what my daughter is able to create and, and how she's able to really um, project her voice with this amazing tool. But I find video editing is relatively tough. We, you know, we've had that we video premium license, which, you know, I think there's so much within that that we could have kids do. And especially if we do end up remotely again and, and we are asking kids to do all these crazy things is like, how do we give them a voice? So I know like Flipgrid can do it as well, but just really looking at like, what tools do we need that really um, focus on student voice and allowing them to uh, take what they're doing and really project it in a creative way. I think that's what I'd like to see a little bit more of or our district buy something that does that. Erin? Um, I, I would I would say that for us in that area, because um, we we are, we presented this week about our language arts approach called Room to Breathe, where our students self-design their own projects and really they are content wow. create creators um, through this work. And um, one of the ones that is really, really versatile and flexible that they've um, and easy to use is Adobe Spark. Um, so that's one that like they can use it to create um, images, video, uh, social media posts, all kinds of things. Awesome. I can't believe Drazix is looking at us like it doesn't have 52 well, I know, That's what he's, he's trying, trying to do. How, how do I just choose one? <laughs> yeah. He's like an ambassador for everything. Mr. Ambassador, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> ambassador of ambassador. I like Mary. I like Mary enjoy collecting little badges, right? So, <laughs> um, but no, um, I agree with uh, creativity tools like WeVideo, the Adobe Sparks, like Fonzie, things like that are great. But I still got to fall back on, um, you know, we're a G Suite school and like what you can do with Google Slides is just incredibly powerful. I mean, um, you know, I, I saw Mary's uh, presentation and what she did with some of the boom learning and how you can make some of those. Uh, like how she makes her slides interactive. Um, I was seeing Derek stuff with the choice boards. Uh, you know, I guess there's just so much you can do. You can embed video, you can embed images, you can link things. Um, I think it's just, you know, if, if you're gonna streamline communication to parents, you can build all of that into a Google slide and then share that out weekly for those kids that need the structure. Um, so I guess I just gotta go with the, the simple tool that can do a ton. Um, you know, now you can add audio, you can, um, nah, there's a lot. So that's one of my go-tos for sure. Tara? 
I, I actually have a question for um because the last thing you said mike was you can add audio in google slides and that's actually something that we have had a challenge with um in our house for our kids is um when teachers embed audio into google slides um it doesn't play on phones or ipads you have to be on a desktop or a laptop to get that embedded audio to play um and so that's been a challenge in a house with five people working online and not having five desktops. Um, so that's what I'm wondering, does, is there work? I, I don't wanna hijack the conversation, but is that a, a unique problem? So now I'm going um, into my phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> problem solving time. Um, I guess. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, I guess it depends on what you're using the um, audio for. I'm especially now because of all of this that we're doing and we're not face to face and how important it is to, for teachers to be showing their faces. Um, I really encourage educators <laughs> to be um, recording video. So um, I think that you might find or teachers might find more success if they record a video and embed that into the slide so if they have to put that through youtube in order to embed it or or put it into just google drive and embed it that way i think would probably work um, for the mobile devices so it works on an android the the audio i have audio in my one slideshow here and that's what that's what melanie got interrupted by so it does play on an i have a google pixel phone but I think I if, you're, if you're using Safari off an iPad, it probably doesn't work. And we had some issues with that too, but I think if you're using, you might try using Chrome on an iPad and you might find it works because it plays nicer. But like, yeah, we've, we've had that issue pop up as well, right? Yeah. We see a lot of issues with audio. We had one last week where like, how do you stop the audio? Remember that one, Kyle? And like, yeah, that, like, yeah. You're out of luck. Like um, it's so like, hopefully they can figure out how to, how to build that in. I think, I think these companies need to, look at that too of like making audio feedback easier and making built-in audio as like an embedded thing not a we have a tool that records audio but when you click on it it downloads it now it's downloaded on your device no it should it should you should click on a button and a play button it should just play to you right so i think companies that you you're hoping that this is really going to drive like how was sharing with me all the changes to meets coming for september and you're like you just hope it becomes a like a race between like building out these tools and these LMSs and listening to the people that are using them remotely and saying what is it they need the most and and trying to factor that in and not being like a tool using another tool outside of a tool and bringing it into another tool and embedding it through that tool they've got to streamline that process to make it so much easier but I've seen that exact same issue you're talking about I think as um, as a tech integrator, I often have, you know, kind of workarounds when things don't work the way that you want them to. And I'm finding myself, you know, when I'm asking questions and people are like, well, I have a workaround. I'm like, no, I don't want a workaround. I just want it to work. I just want to click the button and I want it to work. I don't want to have to do five clicks, 15 other programs, just make it work. Yeah, and I if I'm work. frustrated. <laughs> It's also why I love Buncey because you can add an audio to any single sticker and it plays. Yeah. <laughs> Ambassador. <laughs> yeah. It is a great tool. But that's and that's part of planning with the end user in mind. You know, like I, I do always try and plan with sounds horrible to say, but with a six-year-old in mind, because we want it. There it is. There's the <laughs> first animal. Does that mean we all go grab our animals right now? No, I'm not going to do it. She's behind me. She's sleeping. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think that's how I like to plan. I go and plan not with like what I think is going to work. I don't find the flashes tool. Like I love Drez that you said slides because I have a whole workshop on advanced Google slides and all the cool things you can do and kids do that. Um, but yeah, planning with the end user in mind is going to be key for all this stuff that we're doing for sure. And that's when, like Rob said, when you click once and all of a sudden you're here, no, let's keep it right in there. And so, yeah. It's the idea of like, let's invest our time in like meaningful pedagogy, not long exhaustive workarounds. Like we don't yeah. want our teachers spending five hours learning the tech. We want our teachers 
spending five minutes learning the tech and spending four hours creating really high-end pedagogy that's going to connect to their learners or giving feedback. I think that's really the important thing about where is our time invested when these tools um, don't do and don't meet the needs that we have, right? So that's what I really look at in terms of this is where do we need those tools? And like, I love when people share tools and, and you play with them and you're like, yeah, this is a tool. So Kyle and I are kind of looking to see what, what can we bring? We need those tools in our district. So hopefully we can see more of that come September. Sort of why I asked the question about what's the biggest bang for your buck? <laughs> Dan. Um, talking with my staff, one of the, the tools that was very successful and I played around with as well was the uh, screen Cassify and uh, being able to instruct and talk with your kids. And um, I even had some staff members have kids answer, explaining their thinking. Uh, and we have a video content and it was uh, very powerful. They said, and they're hoping, like Screencastify is free right now, that our board might step up and uh, grab that hole for, for everyone to have access to. Nina, you're not raising your hand, and I can't believe you're not saying it. Exactly. So I'm just going to call you out. Padlet. Um. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Again, it's like, again, a little bit of shame. Here I am amongst people that are exactly the way I am, too. And I'm like, I can't say something so basic. So Dresic, call me up with Google Slides. I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah. Um, I, it really is, uh, again, the jigsaw piece, the going to use them in breakout rooms, going to use them synchronously, asynchronously. Um, it's been It's been incredible. Uh, pedagogy and uh, talk about all of those things that are embedded videos and, and things that they can do and how linked it is. Um, it is super easy for for um, the students to use and do it. And I think we've hit on it here, Kyle. You really you really hit it. If you spend the four hours le learning a tool, I want to be able to not just use it myself. I want my kids to be able to use it. If I'm going to take the time to learn that tool, I I'm thinking ahead. Well, what projects are my kids going to do to to, to create this? Um, and I think they're able to use Padlets and do those those types of things and kind of um, connect them with the other things that they're doing. Um, I just lost my train. I thought I was going to say one more tool. Um, All right, we'll come back to you, Amy. I always go back to the, the G Suite also. I love the simplicity, but if I were to, and especially for the creative side also, so many fabulous things that you could do with that. But if we're talking about modes of instruction, I have to say Nearpod. I have really. Oh, Derek, Derek, oh, Derek, you were going to get called out too. soon. Well, how I, much presentation was that, Tang Yeah. Yeah, I, I just love the interactivity that you can run as synchronous, asynchronous. I've been using it for my own PDs with adults. We've been using the collaboration board to come up with um, different uh, norms and expectations that teachers could put in place for next year if it's remote. It, it's I have to say, if I was going to spend the money, that's where I would I would do that for the instructional piece. Derek, you having to add on to that one? <laughs> uh, yeah. So my thing, like what Amy said, two billion percent. Um, and I, I was kind of leery to say anything, but my students actually request to use that, and they also do it at the university. And why I love it is because. Every tool that you guys were mentioning, like Flipgrid and Padlet, are all embedded into one in Nearpod. There's gamification, and you actually get detailed assessment data that you can yes. use and email to parents, which is so underrated in there. Yes. You provide instant feedback, and I always call it assessment before assessment. They can actually self-assess and see where they are and learn from their peers, and you can offer that like back. And it's also platform agnostic, so it doesn't matter if you are a Microsoft or a Google board. You put whatever file it is into it, and then it makes that work for you. Regardless. And there's also audio. Students yeah. can respond in audio. <laughs> you can give out audio. I'm sorry, I can't say enough about it. You can, uh, Amy, you and I are so linked here. You can even embed Kyle's Twitter stream into your Nearpod, and it'll come up. <laughs> you guys just need more cardboard. The Nearpod badges. I'll send them to you in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Great ambassadors. Jack Dresden, you can have one too. Don't worry about it. You're good. I'll take one of those too. Um, the, but like everyone's been mentioning Google and, and the ease of Google Slides, but in addition, another reason why Nearpod is so awesome is that they've plugged in Microsoft's Immersive Reader. So a uh, shout out to any tools that plug in the Microsoft Immersive Reader to help those students with disabilities, because, uh, you know, that is an amazing tool in and of itself. And I, I know, I don't know what your primary browser of choice is. For me, I use Chrome, but the new Edge browser with Immersive Reader built in is definitely pushing 
uh, for some higher use going forward. And they expect that you can run extensions off of that Edge browser. Um, and little fun tidbit, if you go ed uh, edge colon backslash backslash surf on the Edge browser, uh, you can go down the rabbit hole of, uh, you know, and Google the little jumping dinosaur, uh, the surfer on the Edge browser, uh, you can go have a little fun with that. So there's a little mug of entertainment. Aaron. Um, Mike, thanks for bringing up accessibility piece. Um, I think that's really important for us to think about and talk about. Um, one that our school board has invested in is, because um, we use the G Suite as well, um, but when students look into their Chrome browser, the, the read write extension pops up automatically for them. Um, so that's another one that I think is definitely worth the money um, to, to provide that accessibility piece for everybody. Yeah. Yes. And we're pretty lucky we have that in our school boards. We have Google Read and Write and all the tools that come with it. And that's definitely been extremely helpful where before a lot of teachers saw us like, oh, I hear there's this tool I should know. Now it's like, oh no, here's this tool I need to include everybody. Yeah. Uh, and just real quick, Rob, after I say this, you're next. Um, just to add on to that, I, I have these conversations with districts that back before cloud computing we had we had all software we had to load all of the software on the computers um, our students who had special needs who needed those accessibility tools um, would get that software and we would pay a lot of money for that software as we went to cloud-based computing a lot of those tools have kind of gone away especially because we use a lot of chromebooks so we have to look for alternative tools um, but sometimes Districts may shy away because they have to pay for something like that. But to me, that's not something that's optional. That's a requirement. You have to make sure that it is accessible for every single one of your students. Um, so if we're looking to spend money on things, that would be the very first thing um, that I would say you need to do. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, Kyle got me, and I just thrown on like out with as a Kyle got me really into Google Sites like last year, and I'm like, man, that's one I think goes under teachers' radars in terms of and moving forward, thinking of like full on student portfolios with drop downs and really capturing their learning, the creativity piece of how do they show their learning. My daughter's entire green screen adventure is now on a website and. I really think it's one of those relevant things like becoming an author and, and having to create a web page. And when I and I've used I use I settled on using the Wix, but there was one point when I was trying to find them. I was like, why can't I just use Google Sites? Like, why can't it, it, it doesn't have a couple of things that you need at the level I needed it. But that program is is ridiculous. And even in grade three, they can bang out slideshows and the engagement is top shelf. If very little instruction needed. Mm -hmm embeds all those tools and i think sometimes like the only thing i have against yeah. Google slides is that we just overuse them when i do i ask kids how many slideshows you've made who's made 5 10 15 20 25 30 it's like they all have who's made a web page no hand goes up you say let's party and that that program is mm -hmm. oh my god kyle showed me a couple of things i was like i should have been using this when it first came out so that's a solid tool if you don't use it a lot I also and think it's in how you use it too. And then talk to the other kitchen and have her show you how you get badges for all of your work on Google sites so that <laughs> our kids that way and they can earn the same badges Dresdick is asking out over there. Yeah, it, Amy brought up um, different forms of assessment, alternative assessment, and Google sites is great for portfolio work. And Amy, I know, is a fan of Google Sites. Oh my goodness, huge fan. So first of all, going to that portfolio, I uh, seamlessly had kindergarten through eighth grade all do portfolios because it was that familiar of a tool and kindergartners were able to follow along. And you can make leaderboards using Google Sheets to get that badging embedded, but you can also add gamification to it as well. I don't know if you saw my presentation, but I took a Google Site and I hid all the other sites within and then I made hotspots so the students can navigate through the sites to um, almost choose your own adventure and then I embedded choice boards in there as well so it, it's it's an and if they want to submit the work I, I linked it to the Google classwork page so if I'm creating an assignment in Google classroom you can make a hotspot and link it directly to that assignment for students to submit work almost like what they do in uh, classcraft 
with the adventures there and you could build that same environment within Google sites. I can't say enough about it. The only thing coming from an artist, I get a little frustrated that I can't get full <laughs> capability. Of design. Yeah. Fonts, yeah. I mean, I've worked around it, but I wish yeah. they would let you in the HTML, like they do blogger and you can play around with that a little bit, but I have to say, um, the simplicity uh, alternative assessments it's it's just it's a great tool and everything the other th cool thing is that the website is embedded right within the google site so your little kids if you're building it and you're making those adventures they don't have to open 5,000 tabs like if, for example when you make a choice board and they're going to 15 different websites you can have the choice boards link within and then you can have full control by hiding the navigational panel Wow. Yeah. You, Don't all jump in. <laughs> I mean, Kyle undersold it based on what you're doing. Yeah, you, yeah, Kyle. <laughs> I, need to, I need to stop talking. I'm a moderator. I didn't look up the definition, apparently, and I'm talking too much. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I think we have one more question that maybe we could get a, a quick answer, if possible, from everyone. Do you have one that you want to add? Totally. All right. You do? I do. As, oh, well, mine's not tech related, so this is- Well, mine's not tech related. What are you going to ask? Mine's a simple, once things open up, what's your guilty pleasure that you're going to order from your favorite restaurant? Has nothing to do with this whole oh. conference, so maybe we'll go to my wife who has a more <laughs> conference related question. I mean, so here's the thing. This is what we have learned during this time. He's the fun one. <laughs> I am not the fun one. And I'm okay with it because my question was, <laughs> what is the one thing that you want students to leave your class with at the end of the year? What do you want them to leave with? So you can answer either you know, one you want. I'll preface that with like, I get, I'm the fun one, but she's the smart one. She didn't <laughs> say it that way, but you know, yeah. Um, and I think if we can get an answer on either question from everybody, that would be great. We'll start with Amy. First would be hibachi. I just want <laughs> someone to cook in front of me and just keep giving me food. I miss that. <laughs> um, secondly, I honestly, I, the, I'm not in the classroom anymore, but when I was, it was just knowing that I care. If there's one thing that they walked away from is knowing that I, I listened and I took time to understand them as individuals. Awesome. Nina? Um, that confidence and the advocacy piece. If we're feeling this way as adults, like, I don't know if what I have is worth sharing or what's going on and knowing when to really advocate for themselves. And I feel like that's building up their confidence throughout. So I want them to be able to go on and, and tactfully say to a teacher, this isn't working for me and this is what I need. And if I do it this way, is that okay? So um, being able to really advocate for their own learning. Derek. Uh, Kyle, uh, Greek salad with chicken, um, but Melanie, to your question, I would say a greater ontology of self and a greater belief in self so that they, it's a self-sustaining model and perpetual over time, and just that they know how great they are. Mary. Um, I'm trying to tie the theme together. So for Kyle, I was going to say a good glass of wine in a restaurant, which is be nice <laughs> to sit. Have. So I guess to tie that in, when the kids leave, can they give me wine? Is the, <laughs> um, uh, Mel, I think uh, the inquiry, the, the ability to to ask questions. As a science teacher, it's just so important that they ask questions about the world around them, about what they see, about why things happen. So I really would prefer that they, you know. I have not kept when they leave my room. Dan? Okay, the food part. I can't wait for my church to start making the homemade pierogies again and be able to go pick up some homemade pierogies. I'm excited about that. Um, I think that what I would like my students to um, feel comfortable with is um, getting out of their comfort zone and challenging themselves. I I'd like them to um, take that step and say, yes, I'd like to try that, or wow, I've never done that before. And um, I, hopefully they take that away, and when it's just not so much in in the teaching environment, um, taking it out in, in the real life environment, when, when they're out looking for whatever the case may be in the way of employment or school, challenging themselves. 
Erin? I'm going to go for barbecue. <laughs> yes. I want them to leave knowing the meaning of that Margaret Mead quote about not knowing what to think, but how to think. Mm. Rob? You're muted, Rob. You have to unmute yourself. I know you know you have that power. There you go. Yeah, yeah I thought Kyle keeps me. I don't really have the... I'm not really a foodie, but there's nothing better than me when sitting at a table with a pitcher of beer and just with a buddy and just, you know, hanging out and talking. I think that's what that's one of the things that I miss the most is getting to just do that with really good friends. So and I think I think what I, I hope students will leave with this is an appreciation for something like I, I, I feel like this has taught me a lot about what I had and what I'm missing in life. And I I really think the idea of like embedded gratitude and i've had my since since co when COVID started i had my students or my my son and daughter partake in doing a gratitude app online and they've been doing it for like 80 days straight now and i really think like it's so important that we can see positives when things change and, and walk away with those with not only like learning something but also the idea of appreciating so when we go back i I hope people value time with people more. I hope people value their time more. I hope people value the idea of you don't have to fill every moment with things and, and doing things that you can find happiness just with So I think I think I just hope students can pull those lessons out as well. Tara. Tara? Yeah, all of that. <laughs> all the food. All the food. <laughs> I want to eat all of those things. I want to drink the wine. I want to have the beer with friends. I want to do all of that. And and I, not even being flippant, that's exactly what I, I want my students to come away with is is all all of those things. You know, I want them to know I cared and I want them to have a sense of agency and I want them to be able to self-advocate and I want them to know how to think and and be grateful and just all of those amazing things. Yeah. Mike, your last. <laughs> I've got nothing to add on the student side because everyone really captured that so well. Um, and, and if I could, you know, on the food side of things, I have not really gone out to restaurants or done any of that. I've been kind of holed up here. So I'm, how you answer this question, I guess, depends on are we talking U.S. or Canada, because if I'm going through uh, <laughs> that side, I'm certainly going to roll through a mighty taco uh, at some point here. And uh, on the uh, Canadian side, I've got to go find a, a nice place to get a, uh, some poutine. So if I can, wow, some, <laughs> some really high grade food there, Mike. Well done. <laughs> I am not, I'm not high maintenance or uh, yeah, fancy. I'm just keeping it simple. So. Do you want to answer? Well, I've been having like two pots of coffee every day, so I'm pretty happy um, with food. Uh, you know what? When it comes to me, I need the, and I could make this myself, but I need a good Cuban grilled sandwich, and that's just ham, cheese, <laughs> press sandwiches, and then I'll sneak some ketchup chips which I have to go to Canada for, that's going to be difficult. Um, but, I am <laughs> but as for like, and I know once again, I'm in the, I'm not in the classroom, but I'm almost in everyone's classroom now. Um, I, I think everyone did touch on it, right? Like students leaving with a sense of self, a sense of pride. I think we need to congratulate our students because this has been traumatic and they're going to, come out of this and we're going to start next year however it looks but i think the relationships they form in the future i think they i hope they value those uh when they do get face to face when they get online time any time they have where they get to be um with the people they love and respect and have friendship with i think that hopefully is always going to be valued from here on in Um, I'm going to say some Greek food. I really need a good gyro. Yeah, I could go for that for sure. Um, my students are teachers. So what I want my teachers to know and to leave and to end the year with is you are seen, you are heard, and you are appreciated. So thank you for everything that you do. 
Well, we're moderators. We have to finish this up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with, Wait, well, let's have Andy. With Andy. I bet you he left two hours. Yes. Oh, no, there he is. <laughs> Yay. Food oh, yeah. and last thoughts. Food and thoughts. Oh, geez. Um, oh, food is, is a tough one. But I uh, have to get back to, uh, we've got some good Mexican restaurants here. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that. Um, and uh, as far as last thoughts, uh, this was amazing. I really love seeing everybody and every presentation was different. We didn't ask anybody like this is what this person's going to talk about or this person's going to talk about. I was just really amazed that uh, everyone just kind of put their own flavor and feel to the presentations and each one was unique and different like our presenters. So great job, everyone. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody. Um, thanks for hanging in for two hours and four minutes. Um, thank you for your presentations this week. They are all available on our website, which is, Andy? <laughs> it is, uh, it's a bit.ly link, so bit.ly slash TIFF Summit, all lowercase, that'll get you there. All the presentations all right. are live except for this one. So uh, I think it's officially happy hour time. It's Friday. Everybody enjoy your weekend. Have a great summer. Good and job. we will talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Nice to work with you. Cheers. Stay healthy. Oh yeah, you can stop the recording. See you, Mike.